because we're spoken for, we ought to have a few responses. I'm going to pray, and then we'll talk about those things, and we'll be done tonight. Lord, thank you for loving us. Thank you for your word. Would you work in our hearts now? Would you move us, mold us, help us to be tender, open, and honest, and obedient to you in Jesus' name? Amen. I want to give you just one way in this idea of being spoken for. I shared this with, with the teenagers, and I want to go a little different direction after I share the illustration. But I can't help, when I think of this concept, but go back to the day that I asked my wife, Doreen, to marry me. It was a special day in my life. It was the first time I'd ever asked a girl to marry me. I hadn't done that before. Hopefully you don't have to ever do it again. I had tried to do it at a different time. Uh, uh, when I started dating Doreen, she had said that uh, she wanted to date someone through four seasons or a whole year before she, before she got engaged to this. And that was really, to be honest and quite frank, the dumbest thing that I ever heard in my whole life. Um, she had received this advice from some pagan, I'm sure, and uh, no, I was a friend or godly friend most likely, but, but I, didn't, I didn't like that advice. And, and in fact, I tried to circumvent that four season thing, and I had told Pastor, and he had, and Pastor knows all those old groups. Apparently, there's, an, there's a group called the Four Seasons. By that laughter, some of you people know that as well. <laughs> he had an eight track or something, a vinyl, I don't know what it was. Uh, he had, he had a, a cassette tape, and, and uh, so I played that in the car one day and said, well, honey, that's the Four Seasons, we can get engaged. And he's like, ha, 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 you know, a jack ch toss that out the window. And, and uh, we had started dating in, in May, May 11th was, was the day our first date. And uh, so May 11th would be a year. Well, come January, I about knew this is the girl I'm going to marry and I'm going to buy a ring. And so I tried to buy a ring in January and that didn't work out. I had a problem with my jeweler in Colorado and the money being transferred and, and the size of it. And by the time it was all done, I finally got the ring in my hands two weeks before May 11th. I figured I might as well wait till then at this point. Well, because we had the four kind of four seasons, four, I had four red roses and I had taken one and given one to give her at the door. I took one to, to Zenders because she being German and Frankenmuth likes that and I just had to get her to Zenders and then I um, had one in the car. Used to, she used to leave notes, I leave notes for her in the car above the, the visor and I had one at the covered bridge uh, in Frankenmuth and I'd hit it ahead of time. There's a little place you can hide things and still there, you know, Rose is probably still there today. I didn't hide the ring there, didn't want to lose it like in lost luggage or anything like that. I, actually cared about this ring, and I couldn't afford another one. I actually spent a lot of money on it. <laughs> if you missed a sermon Wednesday night, it's worth hearing the story about Pastor Ryan and his engagement. But then, you know, I got her to Zenders and kind of, you know, she picked it, and uh, they brought out the rose with, the, with, uh, with our uh, beverages, tea, whatever, water, whatever it was. We walked by the bridge on a walk, and as you walk past the spot, I grabbed the rose, and, and uh, you know, and I sat down in front of the river, got on one knee, and asked her to marry me. I remember one distinct thing I shared with teenagers, that I gripped my box very, very tightly. Now, the reason I did this was because a friend of mine had asked his girlfriend to marry him, and she had responded, oh, like this. Now, anyone who knows Doreen knows she can get excited. I hadn't known her that long, but after a year, I knew that she'd get excited. And, what, and when she went like this, oh, uh, my friend's girlfriend hit the ring box, knocked the ring out, and they spent an hour and a half searching for it in the dark. Before the Lord, all I could think of was she's going to hit this ring to the Cass River in Frankenmuth, and I'm going in after that ring in the river. All right, and so I love you, but I'm not going swimming, all right? We got to keep this thing. So I'm gripping it, and of course, she said yes. And at that moment, she became my fiance. She's spoken for. We're going to get married. We're, we're engaged now. We have a, a special relationship. It's, it's different than it was before. She'd call me. She'd say nice things to me on the phone. She began to do some strange things. She began to shop for a wedding dress. And not just any wedding dress would do. Hmm. Honey, you got lots of clothes. But it's not the one I want for my, my wedding. You know, some, some strange things happened. Uh, she didn't date any other boys during that time. She's spoken for. Can you imagine that phone conversation? Hey, honey, can we go on a date tonight? Ah, I can't make it. Why not, Doreen? Well, I'm going out with this guy tonight. What about tomorrow? Ah, I'm busy. Going out with another guy. What? No, she's, 
she's spoken for. Right? It was unique. It was, it was special. She wanted to, to show love to me. She wanted to get ready for this event. And you know what we're called? We are called the bride of Christ. You and I as Christians are spoken for. We're spoken for. It should bring three responses. One, it should bring preparation. Because you and I are spoken for, it should bring preparation. You see, my wife began to prepare for this wedding. And, and oh, let's be honest, women over-prepare for weddings. If a guy prepared for a wedding, what would he do? Order ribs. Oh, not nothing. We'd get food there. Yes, we would. Probably a few TVs. And make it on like a, a college football or football weekend. Maybe Super Bowl. I mean, that'd be the best wedding ever. Would it not be? All right, boys. At halftime, I'm getting married. Then back to the game. It'd be great. <laughs> so Mayor, Pastor Ryan, write this down. Hope Caitlin's watching on live stream. All right, that's what a guy, but what does a girl do? Oh, what colors do I have? Oh, but I can't have those colors because she just had those colors last week. And I can't have those same colors. And uh, invitations. Best part of the wedding preparation. Best part. Gift registry. Take the barcode scanner and walk to the store. You know, take me to the car dealership. I'm going to register, all right? But they prepare. And I would say sometimes over-prepare. But being the bride of Christ... I should prepare for what? His coming. For the marriage supper of the Lamb. The reason that we prepare and are cleansed by the word, the washing of the word, is so that my garments are white and spotless to be presented faultless. Now Jesus cleanses me, but my part is to prepare myself. I'm spoken for. There ought to be something that's been happening. There ought to be something that I'm doing to prepare myself for this day that I meet Christ and have the marriage supper of the Lamb. I'm prepared because I am spoken for. You see, I'm spoken for, so there's a response. Say, I asked Doreen to marry me. She says yes. She's so excited. But two weeks later, I don't hear from her. I can't find her. I don't know where she is. She doesn't return phone calls or texts. She's moved. I'd say there'd been a problem. But how about it, Christian? You're saved. You're spoken for. And we can't find you in the house of God any, at any point. We can't find you in God's word at any point. You're not communicating with Jesus any longer. Listen, we're spoken for. It demands a response of preparation. It also demands a response of love, of passion. See, I got engaged and and I love I love that girl and she likes me most days some days she does things like talk to me yell at me nah she doesn't yell at me but it's love love brings a few things love brings worship first of all or love ought to bring worship the father seeks such that will worship him John chapter 8, it's verse 36. And because I'm spoken for in that love, I ought to worship my heavenly Father. How do I worship him? The Bible says, they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. But where do I find truth? The Bible tells me. Jesus in John 14, 6, I am the way, the truth, and the life. You see, as I worship God, I worship him in truth, and Jesus leads me to that worship. I'm spoken for, and it demands a response of worship. Breeds worship. How do you worship? Well, how do you show love to your spouse? I've been talking with people. There's a book out there. It's a secular book, and it's got some, some psychology, but there's some good points to it. It's called The Five Love Languages. And as a couple, if you're married, if you've never read this, or as a dad or mom, you ought to get the book and read it. Or it is worth the read. Like I said, it's, it's, it's not biblical, but it's got some things that would be helpful to you. Helps you understand people. And one of the things in there it says is we often share love the way we interpret love. That's why a father who travels, perhaps travels a lot, and, and buys things for his child, the child will say, well, Dad, Dad doesn't love me. He's not around. And the father says, well, well how, how can I not love you? Look what I bought you. I, I gave you a house and, or, or what, what not. He's trying to show love a different way. Well, the Bible teaches how to show love to God. It says things like this. It says, if you love me, keep my commandments. 
it tells me how to worship my God. It tells me how to adore him, how to be still and know that he is God. When was the last time you sat down and just worshipped God? You see, as Christians, we get so busy. Even in our devotional time, we just open the Bible, shut the Bible, and forget that it's about a relationship, about worshiping God. And maybe to sit there and say, God, I love you. God, thank you. You know, it's not just a sterile, logical endeavor that I go and want to open God's word, but it's about worshiping God. We come to church to worship. We come to church to hear from God and say, God, speak to me, move me. All right, and it's also, if I can, it's also an emotional attachment as well. There's, there's a great uh, um, correlation in Scripture between what are our feelings and our thoughts and our logic and our heart that parallels our human relationships. And after I get engaged, if I said to Doreen, wow, I really love you. How much do I love you? Well, a lot. Let me just explain it. And if every time I saw her, I just said I love you with zero emotion. Honey, I love you. It's a very good love. It's the best love that I can give you. I hope you appreciate my love for you. Right? She wouldn't put up with that. She wouldn't. She wouldn't be content, and neither would any of you be content with that. So why do we think God is content with that? God, I love you. Why do, why do we find ourselves stuck in these prayers, like before our meals, that are really just things we, we say, rather than worship? One thing we try at camp, and sometimes school revival, is try to worship God. I'm not talking about a Pentecostal feeling running around the building, but I'm talking about worshiping God. When you, when you commune and you meet with him and say, God, touch me, change me, move me. Let me see that you're real from your word. Let me feel that you're real. Let me know that you're real. Let me worship and just say, thank you. I love you. You see, it's spoken for. We're moved by that. We should be moved by that. Love breeds worship. Love breeds obedience. Love brings love. But this shall all men know that you're my disciples, that ye have love one to another. You see, as I'm spoken for, that love that, that God brings in my life ought to be shown to other people. That's one purpose of the church. It's not just to have pews and sit here and be yelled at for whatever many minutes and walk out the back door. It's about people. It's about worshiping God and then ministering one to another. And everyone at church here has a job, has an opportunity. And, and the most important thing you do here tonight may be for someone else. It may be someone that you speak to tonight that needs your prayer this week. That may be the main reason you're here tonight. So that you hear of a burden and you pray. And God works through you. That's love. Love is praying. And God says, people will know you're my disciples by your love. Love brings passion. Love brings, or I'm sorry, spoken for brings passion, preparation. And it brings perspective. Now, after 13 years with my wife, I have a different perspective. Hopefully, after a few years in your marriage, you have a different perspective. Boy, I thought I knew her after a year, and boy, was I wrong in a good way. It's better now, isn't it? I'd rather be married longer than shorter. It brings perspective. As we're spoken for with God, we find out who he is. The, the teens mentioned it, but the Pastor John preached a, ga- a great message on the goodness of God and our perspective. How the world and how our flesh and the devil wants to change your perspective of God. Wants to make him out to be a hard taskmaster. Wants to, to convince you that he's not good. To tell you that he doesn't care. But he does. We're spoken for. Perspective helps me handle what comes in my life. Conflict, pain, and blessings. See, we're, we're spoken for. That's why James says, Know ye not that friendship with the world is enmity with God. That's why John says, Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. That's why Jesus said, I pray that they be in the world, but not 
of the world. We're spoken for. God, Christ, spoke for you. He spoke for me. He prayed for you. He prayed for me. He set you apart like he set me apart. He ordains you to a perfect plan with a perfect life that he has for you, that he has for me. He has all these things ready for us and we're spoken for. And I wonder if you're preparing. If you have that passion, that perspective. Or if you're just spoken for. If that's it. If I can, if you have the ring on and nothing else is happening. If you have the ring on but doesn't mean much. Tell you what, you see a girl who gets engaged and she instantly becomes left-handed. Does she not? Where previously her right hand would perform the operation, now the left hand sits like this about all the time. Oh, look at that. What's that? Oh, your hand broke? No. No, I have a rock. I can barely hold it up on my hand. It's a neat thing, isn't it? It's exciting. It's contagious. You see that, and what do you say? Oh, I'm so excited for you. Right? Have you ever met a girl who was ashamed of her wedding ring or of her engagement ring? I have. Get engaged? Yeah. Can I see it? Slowly brings it out. Wow. Have you ever met a Christian who's ashamed of being spoken for? I have. I have. We're spoken for. I hope and pray that we act like we ought to because we're spoken for. Lord, I thank you for speaking for me, speaking for us as Christians.